And Moses spake so unto the children of Israel. But they did not hearken to Moses for anguish of spirit and for cruel bondage. Exodus 6, verse 9. The message Moses brought was rejected. And he knew why it was rejected. He could see the reason. The people were in such bondage. They were so miserably ground down. They were so unhappy and hopeless that what he spoke seemed to them to be his idle words. There are hundreds of reasons why men reject the gospel. We will not go into them tonight. He that wants to beat a dog can always find a stick. And he that wishes to reject Christ can always find a reason for it. And however unreasonable a reason may be, it will serve a sinner's turn. When that turn happens to be the making of some excuse for himself, why he should not yield to the Savior? Well, that men were less cunning in making apologies for refusing the Lord Jesus. Amongst all the reasons, however, that I ever heard, that with which I have the most sympathy is this one, that some cannot receive Christ because they are so full of anguish and are so crushed in spirit that they cannot find strength enough of mind to entertain a hope that by any possibility salvation can come to them. It is their sad case that I desire to speak to. I think that I can speak to the case of God help me, for I have felt the same. I do remember when I could not believe even Jesus himself by reason of sore anguish and straightness of spirit, and therefore as one who has worn the chains, I speak to those who are still in chains. I know the clanking of those fetters, and what is to fill the damp of the stone walls, and the fear that there is no coming out of prison, and to be so dispirited that even when the emancipator turned the great key in the lock, and set the door wide open, yet still my heart had made for itself a dire cage, and I could not believe in the possibility of liberty, and therefore I sat down in a dungeon of my own creation. Ah, there is no Bastille so awful as that which is built by despair, and kept under the custody of a crushed spirit. Many are the desponding ones whose eyes fail so that they cannot look up or look out. To such I speak. May God speak through me by the Holy Spirit to comfort her first. Will you notice that what Moses brought to these people was glad tidings? It was a free and full gospel message. To them, it was a gospel of salvation from a cruel bondage, the gospel of hope, the gospel of glorious promise. It is a very admirable type and metaphorical description of what the gospel is to us. Moses' word to them was singularly clear, cheering and comforting, but they could not receive it. They did not hearken to Moses for anguish of spirit and cruel bondage. Moses spoke to them about their God. He said, You have a God, and his name is Jehovah, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. They looked up from their bricks, and they seemed to say, God? What have we to do with him? Oh, that the straw were given us to make our bricks. We are up to our necks in this filthy Nile mud, making the bricks, and you come and talk to us about God? Go and preach to Pharaoh and the taskmasters that rule us. But as for us poor creatures, slaves that we are, we do not understand you. What do you mean by Yahweh, our God? Bring us more garlic and onions, or lessen our daily tasks, or take away the sticks from our drivers, and then we will listen to you. And so they shook their heads and said that such mysteries and theologies were not for them. And yet, dear sirs, if any of you were in such a case, it is for you. Jehovah, Israel's God, was indeed their only hope, and he is your only hope also. Alas, that they should be so unwise as to refuse to let the light shine upon them. For light it was. What a poor reason for refusing light, because the night is so dark. Man's best hope lies in his God. O oh, you whose lives are bitter with toil and lack, there is something for you after all, much better than the hard saying, What shall we eat, and what shall we drink? There is an inheritance above the grinding toil of everyday life, 
There is a portion much better than this killing care, which frets so many of you and makes life a calamity to you. Do not, therefore, because of the heaviness of your lot, refuse to hear about God, your Maker, your Benefactor. If that direction lies your only real hope, have this God for a father and a friend, and life will wear another aspect, and you will be another man. Then Moses went on to tell them about a covenant. He said, You have a God, and that God has said, I have also established my covenant with them, to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, wherein they were strangers. Covenant? Why, many of them would hardly know what it meant. Covenant, they said. God made a covenant with us poor brickmakers that have to slave from morning to night without wage and are now forced to make bricks without straw? God and a covenant. These are strange words and ears that hear the curses of taskmasters and the crack of their whips. It sounded like mockery to them to talk of such high matters. I doubt not they muttered to themselves, This Moses is a mad philosopher who has grand mouthfuls of words. But what are words to us? A bit of fish out of the Nile or a cumber from the irrigated fields would be a deal better than talking to us about a covenant. And yet hearken, any of you who are in a sad condition, your best hopes may lie this way. What if God has entered into covenant with you, that he will bless you for Jesus Christ's sake? There may be a mint of wealth for the sons of poverty in this everlasting covenant, and the best kind of wealth, too. There may be for you a promise emancipation which will break the fetters which now hold you and set you free. I tell you that in the covenant of grace lies the charter of the poor and needy. At any rate, if you come under that covenant, it cannot be worse with you than it is now. You seem now to be under a covenant of bondage and of sorrow, and any change will be for the better. If there be another covenant, a covenant of grace and love and peace and everlasting faithfulness, it's worth your while to hear about it and to seek it out until you discover whether you have a part in it. I entreat you, look into this matter. Hearken diligently to the voice of the gospel. Here in your soul shall live. So when Moses had spoken of the covenant, he went on to speak yet more about God's pity to them. He reported that Jehovah had said, I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. I fancied that those words opened their eyes a little. They looked up and said to one another, Is there indeed a God who has heard our groanings? Oh, but, they muttered, look at the many years we have been groaning. Why, it is forty years since this man Moses first came out and saw our burdens. Where has he been these forty years? What is the use of pity that is so tardy in its movements? And yet, dear sirs, if you are inclined to talk so, it may be that if God be slow, he is sure. And if he be slow to you, it is out of patience and long-suffering to others. He knows best when and how to save his people. Remember that when the tale of bricks was doubled, then Moses came, and when you are getting to your very worst and your night is darkening into a sort of hellish midnight, it may be that your darkness is coming to an end. Therefore be not so bowed down as to let the brick earth get into your ears and eyes and make you deaf and blind. But do listen. If there be anything to be heard that is better than your daily moans and groans, Listen to the messenger of God who comes to tell of what God is about to do. He is a God full of compassion, and he has respect unto broken hearts and tearful eyes. And then Moses went on further with his blessed gospel message to tell them about the Lord's resolve to rescue them by a great redemption. The Lord had said, I am Jehovah, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will rid you out of their bondage. 
Do you notice that all along the Lord uses strong words and speaks like a great king? I am Jehovah. I will. I will. I will. When you go home, just notice what a number of I wills there are in this declaration of the great God. When God says, I will, he means it. Depend upon it. He does not ask your leave or wait for your help. I will is omnipotence putting itself into speech. Jehovah will accomplish what he promises. He told them, therefore, that he meant to come to their rescue. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will rid you out of their bondage, and I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. God means to save you, poor, troubled, confessedly guilty sinner. Believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Entrust yourself with him, and the Lord will save you. He will deliver you from all the guilt of your past life, from the evil habits of your present life, and from the temptations of your future life. He will break the yoke of Satan from off your neck and make you to be no more the slave of sin, but you shall become the child of the living God. Moses told him about the Lord's ways of grace and the inheritance which he had prepared for them. My message is after the same sort. Thus saith Jehovah, Tonight, in the preaching of the gospel to everyone that will believe in Jesus, I will save, and I will deliver you, and I'll be to you a God, and you shall know that I am your God, which brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will bring you in unto the land, concerning the which I did swear to give it to Abraham to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it you for an inheritance. I am the Lord. These are great words, but they come from the mouth of the great God, who cannot lie, therefore believe them, and take heart of hope. God will take you, poor, guilty ones, to be his children. He will promote you to be his willing servants. He will use you for his glory though now you dishonor his name. He will sanctify you and cleanse you, and he will bring you to heaven, even you who have lying among the pots and have been defiled in the brick kilns of sin. He will never rest till he makes you sit upon a throne with him, where he is glorified, world without end. This I speak to you who are in bondage, even as Jesus said of old, so say I in my measure. As his messenger, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Believe you in Christ Jesus, and he has come to save the lost, and will give you as clear and clean a deliverance from the power of sin as Jehovah gave Israel deliverance from the power of the Egyptian tyrant. He will bring you out of bondage, guide you through the wilderness till you come into the eternal rest, even to a goodlier land than Canaan, though it flowed with milk and honey. Secondly, we come now to know that it was received with unbelief caused by anguish of heart. The message was from the Lord and it was full of hope for them, but they were too much broken down to receive it. We can quite understand what that meant. Let us look into the case. They could not now receive this gospel because they had at first caught at it and been disappointed. They were under a misapprehension, for they expected to be free at once, as soon as Moses went to Pharaoh, and as they did not get immediate relief, they fell back into sullen despair. When Moses came to them and said that God had appeared to him at the bush, and had sent him to deliver them. They bowed their heads and worshipped. Great things they looked for on the morrow, for they were at the end of their patience. But after that, when Moses went in unto Pharaoh, and the tyrant doubled their labor by denying them straw, they could not believe in God or in his messenger. In the process of salvation it often happens. I have seen it many times, 
that after persons have come to hear the gospel, after they have in some measure become attentive to its invitations, they have for a season been much more miserable than they were before. Have you ever noticed, in taking a medicine, how often you were made to feel more sick before you were made well? It is often so in the workings of the great remedy of divine grace. It discovers to us our disease that we may the more heartily accept a heavenly medicine. Yes, and in special cases there may be evils within the spiritual system which must be thrown out in the flesh to be made visible, and so to become the subjects of repentance and abhorrence. The man who judges with shortness and straightness of judgment demands a remedy that will cure his soul of all the evils on the spot. And if it does not evidently and immediately do this, he cries, away with it. I find that the Hebrew word translated anguish here signifies shortness. Your marginal Bibles have straightness, so they cannot believe because of the shortness of their judgment. They measure God by inches. They limited the great and infinite God to minutes and days. And so as they found themselves at first getting into a worse case than before, they said to Moses deliberately, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians. They might as well have said, You have done us no good. Indeed, you have increased our miseries, and we cannot believe in you or accept your message as really from God, seeing it has caused us a terrible increase of our sufferings. Grace may truly and effectually come to a heart, and for a while cause no joy no peace, but the reverse. I've known many a man come into this tabernacle who has been prospering in business and so on, and yet he has been going down to hell as fast as ever he could travel. Well, he has come and heard the gospel, and he has made a great many improvements in his conduct, and has become a regular and attentive hearer. And at that very time he has fallen into an affliction the like of which he had never experienced before. And he has consequently complained, Why am I worse instead of better? I find my heart grows more rebellious against God than ever it was before. I do not wonder that it should be so, for I have seen so many examples of it. The discipline of the household of God begins very early. But a present increase of sorrow has nothing to do with what the main result will be, except that it works towards it in a mysterious manner. Perhaps what you at first thought with genuine faith was not faith, and God is going to knock down the false before he builds up the true. If you had an old house, and any friend of yours were to say, John, I will build you a new house, when shall I begin? Oh, you might say, begin next week to build a new house. At the end of the week, he has pulled half your old house down. Oh, say you, this is what you call building me a new house, is it? You are causing me great loss. I wish I had never consented to your proposal. He replies, you are most unreasonable. How am I to build you a new house on the spot without taking the old one down? And so it often happens that the grace of God does seem, in its first work, to make a man even worse than he was before, because it discovers to him sins which he did not know to be there, evils which had been concealed, dangers never dreamed of, thus a work of grace even makes his bondage seem to be heavier than ever it was. And yet this is all done in wisdom, in love, and in fulfillment of the promise which God has given. Yet I am never very much astonished when I find people ready almost to turn away from the hearing of the gospel, because after having at first heard it with pleasure, they find that for the time being it involves them in even greater sorrow than before. 
How earnestly would I persuade them to overcome their very natural tendency to a hasty judgment. Press on, dear friend. Be of good courage. Pharaoh will not long be able to make you keep up that enormous number of bricks. Within a very few days he will be glad to get rid of you. Wait, hopefully, for the God who begins in darkness will end in light. And before long you will come to understand those ways of mercy, which are now past finding out. Not many weeks after the sobbing and sighing at the brickyards, Moses and the children at Israel sang this song unto the Lord. Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider has he thrown into the sea. The work of deliverance began very grimly, but it ended very gloriously. The inability of Israel to believe the message of Moses arose also from the fact that they were earth-bound by heavy oppression. The mere struggle to exist exhausted all their energy and destroyed all their hope. The extreme hardness of their lot made them despondent and sullen. They had to work from morning to night. The Egyptian fellows of the present age have known what it is to work very, very hard and to let their earnings go into the coffers of their precious princes. It seems always to have been so with wretched Egypt. It is ever the house of bondage. But these Israelites, being not even Egyptians, but strangers in Egypt, were worked without any pity or mercy. It was a daily question with them whether life was worth living under such cruel conditions. I do not wonder that a great many are unable to receive the gospel in this city of ours because their struggle for existence is awful. I am afraid that it gets more and more intense, though even now it passes all bounds. If any of you can do anything to help the toil-worn workers, I pray you, do it. The poor workwoman who sits so many hours with a candle and needle, and does not earn enough when she has worked all those hours, to more than just pay the rent and keep body and soul together, do you wonder that she thinks that this gospel of ours cannot be for her, and does not care to listen to it? I know that it would be her comfort, but her soul refuses to be comforted. She is so crushed. The dock laborer, who comes home five days out of the six, having earned nothing, and hears his little children crying for bread. Is it any wonder that he cannot hear about heavenly things? Why it is with our white population very much as it is with the Negro population of Jamaica, when there was work to be had, and they could not get enough to eat and more. Our churches were crowded with them. They were the best of hearers and the speediest of converts. They were soon gathered into immense churches. But... When everything went badly with them, and they had to work very hard, barely to live, there were groups of backsliders and multitudes who did not feel that they could go to the house of God at all. They said that they had no garments to wear, and no money to spare. And do you wonder at it? Their poverty was so grinding, and their toil so severe, that the services they had once delighted in they had no heart for. It is all very easy to say that it ought not to be so, but it is so. And it is so with multitudes in London. And yet, dear friend, if such a one is coming here tonight, I pray you, do not throw away the next world because you have so little of this. If you have such a struggle for existence here, you should seek that higher, nobler, better life, which would give you even in penury and want a joy and a comfort to which you are a stranger now. May the Holy Ghost come upon you and raise you out of this present evil world into newness of life in Christ Jesus. I do not find that God's people get into a condition of utter desolation. They are, at their very worst, kept from total desertion. For the Lord has said, I will never leave you. 
nor forsake you. They do have to work hard, and they may come very near to want. But my observation satisfies me that they are happy still, that they are joyful still, and they are uplifted by the inner life above the down-dragging depression of external trials. I would to God that I could say a word that might comfort any child of poverty who should happen to be here tonight, and I pray the Lord himself to be their comforter and helper. But worst of all, there are some who seem as if they could not lay hold on Christ because their sense of sin has become so intolerable, and the wretchedness which follows upon conviction has become so fearful that they have grown almost to be continually despairing. I hardly know of any condition of mind that is worse than chronic despair, when at last that which seemed alarming enough to drive to madness settles down into a lifeless, sullen moroseness. These Israelites had at last sunk so low that they said, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians. But your lot is terrible. We know it is. They said, But we shall never get out of it. But your bondage is horrible. Yes, but you may make it worse by interfering. It will only aggravate our taskmasters and bring upon us that last straw which breaks the back. Let us alone. We are doomed to suffer. We are predestined to be bondsmen. Let us go on as quietly as we may in our slavery. It may be like that poor fishes in the cave. We may lose our eyes yet, and then we shall not know that it is dark, for we shall have lost the capacity for light. Oh, it is a dreadful thing when a heart gets to that. When a man desires that Christ would depart from him, and let him alone to perish. Do not some men virtually say, I know I am lost. Let me enjoy myself as well as I can. I cannot. I cannot enjoy sin. But don't vex my conscience. Do not worry me with your talk here, for I shall suffer enough hereafter. Do not tantalize me about saving faith, for I shall never believe. Do not begin talking to me about repentance. I shall never have a soft and tender heart. I know I never shall. A man who has begun to be numbed with cold cries to his comrades, leave me to sleep myself to death. And thus do despairing ones ask to be left in their misery, their soul. We cannot, we dare not, thus desert you. I will tell you what you shall do. Dear soul, do give me a hearing. In the name of God, believe that there is yet hope, that even now Christ Jesus invites men, and especially such as you, to put their trust in him. O oh, you who are burdened with sin, he calls you to let him be your savior. If there is a man in the world he died for, you are the man. If I see a physician hurrying down the street in his brogham, and anybody says to me, Where is that doctor going? If I knew every house in the street, I should pick out the case of a man that I knew to be in the worst condition and most near to death's door. Sir, I should say, the doctor is going there. That dying person needs him most, and I believe that he is hurrying to his bedside. If there is one man here that is worse than any other, more sad, more sick, more sorry, more despairing than another. My Lord Jesus Christ, who is here, has come to meet such an one. O oh, troubled heart, Jesus has come to seek and to save you. I am sure it is so. Hope thou, hope thou, hope thou, thou art not yet beyond hope of salvation. Lift up your eyes, for you are not yet where the rich man was after his death and burial. Do not yet despair, may be. There awaits you yet a happy life of joy in God. The sun may yet bring you brighter days, days of peace and rest and usefulness. Did you never hear the story of John Newton on the coast of Africa? He had got himself into such a state by his sin, his drunkenness, his vice, that at last he was left on the coast of Africa and virtually became a slave. Did John Newton dream? 
when he wandered up and down with a hungry belly full of fever and at death door, that that day would come when he would be the companion and dear friend of William Cooper? And when the church at St. Mary, Woolnoth, over there in the city, would be crowded every time he stood up to preach a free grace and dying love? He did not think it, but it was so predestined. Something equally gracious may be ordered for you. Blasphemer, you may preach the gospel yet. O oh, thou Magdalene, full of filthiness, you will yet wash his feet with your tears, wipe them with the hairs of your head. You black villain, you may yet stand among that white-robed host, of whom the angel asked, Who are these, and whence come they? You, even you, will sing more sweet and loud than any of them to him that loved you and washed you from your sins in his precious blood. God, make it so, and to his name shall be praise forever and ever.